All right. Well, welcome everyone to Roundabout Books Tuesday Virtual Author Series. My name is Julie and I'm the events manager at the store. So before we get started with tonight's event, I want to remind everyone to check our event calendar online or on Facebook to find out about upcoming events and book clubs. Uh, on March 15th, we will be talking with Lillian Rivera about her new book, We Light Up the Sky. Then on March 29th, we'll be joined by Peter Zitlin. Um, I keep getting that one bad, uh, to talk about Annie Londonderry, who was the first woman to bicycle the world in 1894. Um, and as some of you might know, we are expanding and renovating the store. So make sure to check our website for details on days we might have modified hours or closures. And visit roundaboutbookshop.com for more details. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Zoom. I just want to remind everyone to stay muted while the authors are talking, but please feel free to have your video on so we can see who is joining us. And then towards the end, we'll open it up for a Q&A. If you're not familiar with how to use the chat function, you can always raise your hand and I'm happy to unmute people so that you can talk directly to the authors. Um, this event is being recorded for our YouTube channel, which has the recordings of all of our events since May 2020. So tonight's authors might just help us prove that the West Coast is the best coast. David Bannis and Hunter Shove are the team behind Portlandness, which tells the hidden stories of our neighbor to the north. Now in Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, the pair explores and compares three West Coast landmarks. Crosscut Magazine says, the graphics are the key to the book. Creative, eye-catching, and sometimes weird, at least one is stitched in needlepoint, but the overall effect is a kind of visual almanac that presents information you can take, interpret, or commit to memory as you wish. This is a digestible way to consume numbers and data points. There is an art to it. The data might not change your view of any of the three cities, but bits will stick to your mental socks like burrs. If you want urban detail and comparison with sister cities, especially in ways you never knew you wanted, this is a book for you. So David and Hunter, thank you so much for joining us tonight from one of these cities, Portland. Um, I'm really excited to hear more about this. I got my copy at PNBA back in October. So I turn it over to you to talk to us about Upper Left Cities. Thank you so much for having us. We're really pleased to, to share um, the new book that we have. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, this, this is an outgrowth of a previous project it was called Portlandness, which was published in 2015. And both of our books uh, involved the contributions, the collaboration of many students, many colleagues. And so this isn't just uh, the two of us, but rather a whole group of people who have put this together. Um, so there's lots of different looks and perspectives included inside. So let us tell you a little bit about what we think a cultural atlas is. And most people have heard of atlases, they know what an atlas is. And the strength of most atlases is that every page is pretty similar and that the maps are pretty similar so that they can be used in a similar way. But a cultural atlas is something a little bit different. It's something that provides people with new cartographies, new ways of understanding places. A cultural atlas examines different meanings people attach to the same places and reveals something about that. It challenges and develops our geographic imaginations. We might think we know these cities really well, either from being there or from images we have seen, and we're hoping to put a book together that will challenge the way that we conventionally think of these places. And it's important to say as well, though, that this atlas isn't intended to be comprehensive in any way. If anything, it's a set of ideas to start conversations about these cities and about cities in general. And also a little bit about maps in general. We can, kind of, since that's the, you know, the visual focus of this book. Um, and that's that maps have a very strong hold on people's imaginations. And when presented with a map, most people just take it as authority. I mean, when when's the last time you questioned a map you saw as to whether it's right or wrong? Um, <clears throat> but we like to point out that maps are simply representations of how people see places. They are not the place themselves. There's the well-worn quote, the map is not the territory. Um, 
but it's good to remind yourself of that. The map represents a point of view and tells a story. It always does, no matter um, who it is that's creating the map. Google's telling stories, National Geographic, and so are we. Um, and then a reminder that the maps don't just happen. They're made by people, um, the cartographers, who then make a decision about what to put on the map and maybe more importantly, what not to include and what's the best way to represent things. And sort of kind of uh, to riff off of these ideas, one thing we did in the book is um, playing with the actual geographic size of the different cities. So it just so happens, you can see the shape of the three cities overlaid here at the bottom. And um, you can fit, if you squeeze it in there, you could fit Seattle and San Francisco inside of Portland in terms of area. So Portland's way bigger and San Francisco is a quite small city, almost a, just a third of the size of Portland. But in the book, we, we changed the size so they all be kind of the same. So the San Francisco maps are a little bigger, the Portland maps are a little smaller. So what we'd like to do is take you through a bunch of the themes that we've explored. And for the first number of slides, we're actually gonna read some excerpts from the book, which we generally don't do, but we figure, you know, let's get with the program here. It's a book reading and we should read some of the book, we wrote it. Um, so we'll do a little of that and then we'll just talk about other pages. But what you're looking at now are pages from a, uh, a four page or yeah, four page spread called Graveyard Shift that deals with cemeteries historically in each city. And so I'll read a little bit about that. I'll read the general part and the part that applies to San Francisco, which is the map that you see on the right. Room for the dead is running out. Urban cemeteries are becoming increasingly rare and those in the upper left are no exception. San Francisco, Portland and Seattle have seen the vanishing of cemeteries and the exhumation of the dead themselves. Across the world, burial is a common way to dispose of bodies and provide a space for commemoration. American cemeteries grew out of the Christian practice of delineating and personalizing grave sites. Mid 19th century European Americans generally buried their dead in communal graves, churchyard cemeteries, small individual sites or family plots. By the 1890s, larger cemeteries of about 250 graves were common throughout much of the United States. In the 20th century, cemeteries with hundreds or thousands of graves became the norm. And now the story of San Francisco. San Francisco only has three cemeteries, the Mission Dolores Cemetery, the San Francisco National Cemetery, Cemetery in the Presidio, which technically isn't really part of the city, and a remarkably well-preserved pet cemetery that's also in the Presidio. As the map indicates, there used to be more cemeteries in town, including the big four around Lone Mountain. That's Laurel Hill, Oddfellows, Masonic, and Calvary. By the late 1800s, San Francisco cemeteries had reached capacity, were largely overgrown and falling apart, often served as a site of criminal activity and were perceived to be a health hazard. So developers also wanted this prime real estate in the rapidly growing city. Sound familiar? So in the 1890s, the Jewish cemeteries were closed and were developed into Mission Dolores Park. A new Jewish cemetery was established in the farmland of what is now the town of Colma. San Francisco banned burials within city limits after August 1st, 1901. And just after a decade later in 1913, the Board of Supervisors went a step further and ordered the closing of all cemeteries and mandated the removal of all bodies. By the 1940s, the remains of 150,000 people were disinterred and moved from the big four out of town. The bodies went to Colma, a town incorporated in 1924 by an association of cemeteries. It now has nearly 20 cemeteries and a living population of approximately 1,500. It is said that the dead outliver, outnumber the living by a thousand to one in Colma. The abandoned Laurel Hill Cemetery was subsequently developed into residential blocks. The Masonic Cemetery became the site of the University of San Francisco. A public golf course and the California Palace of the Legion of Honor now sit on the site of City Cemetery. A 1993 renovation of the latter yielded more than 700 bodies remaining from the old cemetery. And so the picture that you see on the upper left there is a 1931 shot of workers exhuming bodies from the Oddfellow Cemetery in uh, San Francisco. So the larger story is that 
Places get established and very quickly they change and these changes sometimes are a part of them. Okay, so here's two maps from a six page spread that talks about um, public spaces. One, one map for Seattle, one for Portland, one for San Francisco. And I'll read a little sort of intro to this. Um, so you check out these, um, these maps. Um, Underneath any urban history are plans that could have been once were and or never should have been in the first place. Scratch the surface of your favorite city, you'll find a rich history of destruction development and imagine futures made possible by the creativity and determination of planners, policymakers, and group, grassroots advocacy of local experts, the residents. Um, public spaces have many functions, but above all, they are spaces that people are able to occupy without paying anything. Um, the famed public spaces of ancient Greek cities were the agoras, which served as marketplaces and areas to assemble. In ancient Roman cities, um, it was the forums, places to go and openly exchange ideas. Throughout the U.S., the agora and the forum both evolved into uh, plazas and parks and sidewalks, all, all public space spaces. The, the following tales suggest that the public spaces we experience in upper left cities today were not built overnight. They may spring up in areas formerly used in, for very different functions. Um, attitudes toward these spaces are enmeshed in the politics, the economic pressures, and the realities facing haves and have-nots. And so what we have here are two of the three we talk about the one on the left is um, something that never happened, but was proposed for the city of Seattle, and that's the commons. Um, it was in the 90s proposed as a way to revitalize a sort of light industrial area of town uh, and create this very large park that would have connected the retail core in downtown Seattle down at the bottom of the map to Lake Union. Um, and form a, a grand central park for the city of Seattle. And although, um, so this was put to vote, uh, the residents of Seattle, uh, although they didn't oppose the park so much, were worried about the fate of the small businesses in the area that would be uprooted and moved and voted down this proposal. Um, and so fast forward in 25 years to the future, to now and what's there? Well, all those small businesses are gone, no park and a lot of buildings supporting um, Amazon and a whole heck of a lot of condos. A little bit of remnant photo at the bottom shows a little remnant of what it used to be, soon to be long gone. Um, on the right is a little happier story, um, is the revitalization of um, Portland's waterfront where after the I-5 interstate was built, it rendered obsolete the Harbor Drive, which is on the downtown side of the river. And that Harbor Drive was taken out and replaced by what you can see on the right, which is um, Tom McCall Waterfront Park, kind of the signature public space of the city and including even some public space on the, the east side of the river. So. In this case, the replacement of a you know, highway with a park. And a similar thing happened in San Francisco. We're not showing the, the map, but um, that after the 1989 earthquake, the Embarcadero Freeway was removed. It was you know, partially destroyed and replaced by a series of public spaces um, that has really revitalized that waterfront as well. So what you're looking at is um, a, uh, a part of the book that is entitled, let me see if I can have it here, entitled Blue Notes Lost Jazz Clubs. And so we wanted to look at music. We wanted to look at different neighborhoods. And so we looked at some historic, um, some areas of historic uh, uh, jazz clubs which were in pre predominantly African-American um, neighborhoods in each of the cities. And so this is Fillmore Street in San Francisco, Williams Avenue in Portland and Jackson Street in Seattle. 
And the way this data was collected was by reading about jazz clubs in the past. There's no one database that has all this information. So we had to research each city individually. And when we got all the names of the clubs and the dates, we had to think of an interesting way to map them. One of the things we do in a cultural atlas is we use lots of different uh, mapping styles. That's, that's non-traditional oftentimes. And so uh, Zuriel Van Bell, who is the cartographer here, decided it would be really interesting to map these on the one street as if it were music. And then the bars that come up are the cross streets, as you can see. And so we get some idea of the, the layout of the clubs um, and we've, we've made it into uh, some music as well. For a while, we thought we might be able to have it stand on its own as music, as it would be properly written. We realized we either had to go for cartography or music. And so we went for cartography, although Zuriel's brother has subsequently composed this into something um, sounding a little bit more perhaps like uh, more experimental jazz than the, the era that it represents. But anyways, uh, it was accomplished. What I'd like to do is just read the introduction from this section um, to let you know uh, what we're thinking about here. When it comes to music, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle are probably better known for rock stars than for jazz artists. Yet each city has a rich, rich jazz history of its own. Three streets figure prominently in these histories, Fillmore Street in San Francisco, Williams Avenue in Portland, and Jackson Street in Seattle. The stories of jazz clubs on these streets illustrate how economics, popular culture, and racial politics combine and change places. Fillmore, Williams, and Jackson were not the only streets where jazz thrived in these cities. However, each hosted the scene at a time when jazz was at the height of its national popularity and at a time when ethnic and racial segregation was in full effect. Many jazz clubs were black owned at a time when non-whites were not permitted uh, in white owned clubs. These streets anchored the heart of jazz scenes and neighborhoods that were central to black economic and cultural life and were some of the only areas in these cities where black people were allowed to live. During the 1950s and the 1960s, redlining, blockbusting, and urban renewal took an enormous toll on these neighborhoods and their jazz clubs. In addition to these racial and urban politics, jazz was becoming less popular. However, while many jazz clubs have disappeared, the music has not. And then the pages that follow, the four pages that follow, we give it a little bit of special attention uh, to each city and to some of the history there, but we try to follow it up with a little bit of what's happening right now because this isn't a story that's necessarily over, it's a story that's changed. And although you won't find lots of jazz clubs, you will still find live jazz music in the city. Okay, so these three maps are from um, two pages entitled, Is There Gas in the Car? And what you're looking at here are um, maps that show areas in each city where you have high and low gas prices. Um, and I will read a little bit from uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, text that accompanies the maps. Um, anyone traveling through a city by car will note that gas prices vary widely often seemingly without rhyme or reason. San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle are no exceptions. How do these cryptic gas prices get set? Um, because gas prices do not reflect the cost of crude oil. There are many other charges baked into the dollar spent at the pump. Uh, turns out though the oil industry as a whole is making big money, gas stations actually don't pull in high profits. Uh, most gas station operators don't make their money from sales at the pump, but from retail goods, such as beer and cigarettes. Um, oil companies don't give vendors much of a discount unless the vendors buy large amounts, which most stations cannot afford to do. Um, to stay competitive, many stations mark gas, gas up only a few cents a gallon. Factors that might affect how much a gas station charges per gallon include location, quantity purchase, uh, rent costs, branding, um, state and local taxes also affect price. California's gas prices are the highest in the contiguous U United States, in part because California's clean gas laws are stricter than federal standards. But often the reason gas costs more in some neighborhoods than others is zone pricing. Gas pricing zones 
also known as market zones, are means for distributors to set a selling price to vendors based on a region. And although the zone price is determined by some undisclosed recipe, often that includes traffic volume, local income levels, and local competition. So we feel like by looking at these maps, which are designed with a, um, one of our contributors designed this oil slick sort of look to the maps, um, you know, to, to think of it, does this match your experience if you are aware of or paying attention to where prices are, are high? And think of, again, why that would be. Um, oftentimes you will see the highest prices in the high in the most well-to-do neighborhoods. So it gives you not something interesting to look at as well as um, something to think about. Whoops, there we go. Oh. Sorry, so what you're looking at here are three maps um, that were designed uh, in analog form. In other words, they weren't made with computers, they were made by hand. And this corresponds with a part of the book where we're looking at the um, pushback to, to digital, the backlash to digital, and the idea that some people are trying to purposely engage in things that are analog and try to capture some of what was lost. And we thought it would be interesting to look at some of the changes in analog technologies versus what was happening today. So what we did is we uh, got a bunch of information about film developing locations, piano stores, record stores, and typewriter stores from 1987. And so if you wanna do research from 1987, you wanna research businesses, how do you do that? The answer is the yellow pages. You let your finger do the walking. And so what we did is we, we contacted the libraries and libraries in each city, and they sent us, they sent us scans of the yellow pages. And we went through and we counted all these businesses. And then maps were created and they were handed off to Stephanie's son, who's an artist. And she, in the case of San Francisco, made uh, she drew by hand this, this, uh, this board and made stickers of her own and then placed the stickers in the location of those businesses in 1987. In the case of Portland, she decided to do some needlepoint and she put this together and sewed uh, uh, the shape of Portland, put the rivers in there. And then these are all data points that she's chosen different colors for. It's hardest to tell what's going on in Seattle. This is actually a much larger map that involves lots of block, um, block printed pieces of paper that were sewn together and to form by neighborhood to, to form Seattle. And then the data points are all buttons of different colors. And when she first did it, she had black as one of the button colors and realized it didn't pop correctly. So she took them all out and put all a different color back on. And it's a fantastic way to sort of commemorate this data from an analog era. And to let you know how much things have changed, I'll give you one example. In 1987 in, in Portland, there were something like 28 typewriter stores. That's how business were done. People were banging out their work on IBM Selectric. But today, or at the time, let's say that this was made, there was just one typewriter store in Portland, and that was the only one we found in all three cities. I guess the good news is subsequently, there's another typewriter store that has appeared in Portland in my neighborhood, so I will go check it out and report back to everybody in the near future. What you see here is the second page of the spread, and this uh, records all of the information for each of those locations uh, in 2000 or 2019, I think it was. And so we've used this sort of matrixy digital readout to indicate where the uh, remaining photo developing store, piano store, record store, and typewriter stores are, um, giving you a different look at the data than you had before. Okay, so we have a number of pages where we kind of took different approaches to exploring urban form. And these create these little creations here that look like mosaics or weird stained glass windows or something um, are actually based on the location of traffic lights. And so we've called these tap traffic light tapestries. And so what this is essentially showing about the city is that at the center of each one of these shapes shown on the map is essentially a traffic light. And so you can see downtown, there's a whole bunch of really tiny shapes so much that they all kind of run together, but out in more um, 
you know, outer areas of the city, the shapes get bigger because you have fewer traffic lights. And although this, this is just an interesting look by itself, and these are called fees and polygons, um, if you're a map geek, um, you can see the actual locations of the traffic lights are shown in white on this little map here. Um, but what they do show is some interesting urban forms. If you learn how to read this, you can see some things going on. Let's look at some of the, the maps from the Seattle one on the left and San Francisco on the right. You know, the, the downtowns, you can see, you know, this definite concentration of traffic lights, but you can also see other features of the, the city, such as very long arterials with lights. This is Rainier Boulevard in, um, or Avenue in, in Seattle. Um, and then you can see the very hilly areas in um, San Francisco in the center of the map that have very few traffic lights. And so you can kind of figure out what's going on in the city by looking at these um, and studying them, or you can just appreciate that they look kind of interesting by themselves. We, we chose a color for each city um, and we didn't use it throughout the book, but we used it from time to time to try to create a little bit of coherence there. So that's, we ended up picking red for San Francisco because we figured that was kind of Golden Gate Bridge-ish, San Francisco 49er-ish. Um, we chose green for Portland because you know moss grows on concrete here. And then uh, Seattle was uh, blue because uh, water, although a big feature of, of each of the cities is, is very big feature of what's happening there. And uh, you know, the sports teams wear blue too, so that helped out. So uh, this is a, probably a good time to mention that we finished this book in March, 2020, early March, 2020. We're like, great, we finished and it will come out in the fall. I mean, what could possibly happen to stop that? And then of course, you know, something did happen and the industry sort of switched, the mini industry switched. And our editor said, you know, we're gonna hold this book back and we're gonna release it in fall of 2021. And we said, okay, that's a good idea. And then when the fall of 2020 rolled around, we realized they hadn't printed the book yet, but we started to realize if the book came out without certain topics in it, it, it would feel pretty, um, it would feel lacking. It would be, feel like something was missing. And those topics um, were COVID itself, um, the, 2020, uh, the, the 2020 election, because we had information about 2016, and then the, um, the protests that dominated the country um, during 2020 as well. And, uh, and there were protests, and these are the pages that sort of document that. We had to put these pages together much more quickly than anything else in the book. And we thought that documenting a 100-day timeline um, by highlighting some of the uh, events that happened in the, in the on the side of protest would be a good way to go about um, talking about this. And you can see at, uh, at the timeline at the bottom there that you know, there's a lot indicated for Portland because Portland had very intense protests during that, inter that ent entire time. There were some very big protests in San Francisco. A lot of those were earlier on. And Seattle had its own situations as well uh, with the uh, autonomous zone and all kinds of things. So we wanted to try to bring this together and collate it to sort of keep a little record of what had happened during this very tumultuous time. Uh, and this is the way we ended up representing that. So we also created a map for each in city to, to highlight where, where these events were occurring because they weren't occurring everywhere. In fact, if, you know, one of the things that became a little bit annoying about living in Portland at the time was everyone saying, oh my God, the city is on fire. You know, is, are you safe? Um, it's like, well, this is only happening in a few places. It may be happening on a regular basis and it may, may be pretty intense in those places, but it's not the whole city that is experiencing this. And that's one of the things we wanted to, to highlight where um, significant events were going on. And in Portland, you can see this, this core at downtown that was every single night for a couple months, but then a few other um, locations that were the uh, focus of particular repeat demonstrations. But again, a kind of relatively specific and confined places. So I would design this map with a little kind of tear gas motif in the background. Um, 
and we have a, a similar one for each of the other three the other two cities. Well, so this is this is a page that's called Nonstop Hub Hop, and we wanted to look at the places uh, where you could connect to, where you could fly to directly from each of the cities, and also wanted to track some of the um, travel that you could engage in between the three cities. And so this is all information that was recorded in 2019, so it, it might be a little bit outdated. However, this is pretty much the scene, and it also helps articulate a little bit the global position of each city. As you can see, San Francisco, and we've included Oakland there because it's so close, there's far more options for traveling internationally directly from the Bay Area than there is from Seattle or certainly from Portland. And so it gives you a little bit of idea of the global position of these cities and, and some of the places that these cities have relationships to because they have the direct flights. Um, and the, the middle graphic there talks about how frequently you can go from between each city. And at one point, there were 25 flights between San Francisco and Seattle and another 10 from Oakland and Seattle. So these places are all extremely highly connected with one another, of course. OK, so these, these images come from um, a set of six pages called Breaking the Grid. Um, where we explore two different things. On the left, um, we were inspired by a French artist by the name of Marmel Caron, who um, has done work with rearranging city blocks into to, to see if you can come up with patterns, interesting shapes, and so on. So we decided we would try this ourselves. And it started out with thinking, oh, we do a good part of the city, but realized that that's not going to happen. That's a lot of blocks. Um, and so we focused on the downtown in each city. And then each city also has a major diagonal that runs across. Um, we pick um, Market Street, Sandy Boulevard here in Madison and Seattle. And so we take the blocks that are adjacent to the diagonal because the diagonal forms kind of interesting shaped blocks. And then a couple of our cartographers um, started playing around with rearranging each of those blocks. And so besides being kind of just, a, again, another interesting visual like the traffic light tapestries, you can learn about each of the cities um, by, by checking out these shapes. You can see Portland's incredibly regularly shaped blocks, which you rarely see in most cities. Um, and that really comes comes out. Um, the, with the diagonal, and you see the very weird looking large public space that is attached to the diagonal. And that forms the large monsterish looking shape in the middle of that graphic. Um, and then each of these, um, for each city, we, pa um, we paired these little art pieces with um, what we deemed unusual urban forms. And so if anyone's familiar with Portland, um, Lad's edition is what comes to mind um, right off, off the top of your head. Um, so what's shown on the right though are three odd neighborhoods for the city of San Francisco, uh, kind of urb, uh, suburban developments within in the Southwest corner of the city, but are, that are within the, the boundary of the city. Um, and one of the kind of uh, ugly parts of this story is that many of these neighborhoods, when they were built, came with um, covenants that kept certain racial groups or even ethnic groups from living in these places. So these were developed, you know, to serve a certain citizen and not others. Um, so two pages for each of the um, for the cities, looking at, again, how, you know, the various urban forms we have within these cities. So what you're looking at are some of the last maps in the book. And these are uh, geographically correct-ish crossword puzzles. And so I, 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 you know, I got to the point where I, like, I would really like to make a map using words and I'm not sure how to do that. So I got out a piece of graph paper and then I, and I started with San Francisco, which is the city that I thought I would be able to have 
do the best job with. And um, just started making a list of all the neighborhoods and you know uh, landmarks that I thought would be included in something like that. And then try to, to just put them together sort of in the right spot in the city um, to, to make a crossword puzzle type thing. And then the real fun began. And that's once we had everything. Um, oh, shoot. It's not showing up. Oh, well. Oh, there it is. Um, once we had everything developed, we had to come up with clues for these things. So that was the fun was researching for, for each of these places. We'd research maybe three or four or five clues. And then we would get together with our contributors. We had these regular sort of working sessions and we would read them out and people would tell us which ones they thought sounded the most like a crossword puzzle or the most interesting. And so we learned a lot of really specific information about certain places by making geographically correct crossword puzzles of each city. I would, I would put, uh, I would put in that, this was one of the more um, fun little things to try to, to do is come up with clues, crossword like clues and come and finding out really unusual things about each of these places that you could potentially use as a clue. We were gonna, we were thinking of reading what some of them were, but I don't, I think you have to view them as a whole, really. And this is somebody's handwriting, right? So this is yeah. Jonathan Van Bell's handwriting. So his own custom font. His own custom font that we provided for us for, uh, for this to give it that uh, real look. We also have a word search puzzle as well. That's how we fit it fit in. I think movies and right uh, TV shows or something. We're trying to get all the pop culture in there in the last chapter. Now we already mentioned this, but um, this was a big impact to what was in the book. And the, although we added, we had to plug in the new pages, we couldn't actually move anything around when we did this. We just had to, the book was already laid out. So they said, well, if you have, if you wanna replace six pages, you have to replace it with six pages and it has to go in the same exact place in the book. And so that was a bit of a challenge, but we were able to update a few other maps. So one, one related to fires, a um, few others as well, beyond creating these new pages. And you can see our four page spread on um, co related to COVID where we focused partially on um, the, the actual data from you know, cases and deaths but also the economic impact, which is shown below, which, which industries were most impacted by the shutdowns that occurred. And there's little graphs of, of employment and then a, the a tremendous drop in public transit ridership shown at the bottom. And th those choices were driven in part because we wanted to tell the story not only of the you know, the incidence of, of COVID, but the impact that it had on people's lives economically. And then it also fit really well in the economy chapter to do that. So that went uh, to-, to Right, that we didn't have a pandemic chapter ready to go for this. So we had to fit it in somewhere. All right, so lastly, um, just a few concluding thoughts is that People often ask us about, well, did you think of doing this? Did you think of doing that? Well, we thought of doing uh, hundreds of different things or, and our contributors came up with so many ideas. Um, coming up with the ideas though is the easy part, but then turning those ideas, well, are they ideas that can be researched and then distilled into a story and then represented visually and represented for all three cities? That's the hard part. Um, there were some topics that we really tried to make work that, you know, for example, bicycling is, is really well known, at, you know, in Portland, it's, it's, it's often listed as one of the top two or three bicycle cities. Um, but we couldn't think of a way to represent that well in Portland, and we couldn't think of ways to represent that well in the other cities as well. So just because, um, you know, there was something that was associated with the cities didn't mean that it automatically made the book. We had to make a way to make find a way to make it work for each city and, and to tell a reasonable story, um, something new, something different. Um, we will say that probably the most satisfying part of the whole project was 
that we get to collaborate with lots of different people. And we would get to have people, uh, you know, we'd have meetings every month or so and get people together and talk about ideas and see what people are doing and tracking that. And it became um, a real community of people who were trying to put this together. And, and that was a very uh, important, satisfying part of this project. And the last thing we always like to show is that community itself. And a special shout out to our collaborator, Zuriel Van Bell, who was with us uh, all, all along the way and really in, instrumental in not just creating pages, but in parsing um, and, and critiquing all the others. And then our two lead contributors, Sachi Arakawa and Jeff Gibson, um, and kind of interestingly split Sachi from the very beginning when we were first proposing this project even in a very different format. Um, she was involved at that point. Jeff joined a little later, but carried it on to the end as one of our one of our contributors we could always rely on. And then the cartographers and writers and artists um, that contributed are listed here. A lot of students or former students or people who started out as students and became colleagues over the course of the five years we worked on this. Um, and then we also did collaborative work with three different um, one of our own classes, Maps and Society, but two classes at Portland Community College as well helped contribute both material and ideas to the, the book. So we thank you for fortunate. listening to us. Um, and we feel fortunate as well to be with Sasquatch Books, a really great team of people who believe really strongly in both of our projects and work really hard to, to deliver a fantastic um, publication. So we're, we're thankful to be working with them as well. So we'll end there um, and entertain questions. Awesome, thank you. Yes, yeah, Sasquatch Books does amazing work. Um, I love that final graphic of the weed dispensary. <laughs> I used to live on the Green Mile <laughs> off of Sandy and 205. Um, and now I live in a town where it's not allowed. There's no dispensaries allowed in the city of Redmond. Um, yes, I see Kathy well, has her hand up. What's it, what's interesting that you say that is we only showed the one map, but if you show the three cities together, mm -hmm. um, Portland's weed store is a veritable forest. Not so much in Seattle and San Francisco. It's got yeah. Portland has more stores than the other two cities put together. I know, isn't that? It's and it has funny. the lowest population. Yeah, so. <laughs> there are some really funny. I mean, keep Portland weird. So, Kathy, I'm going to. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, we were actually eating dinner. That's why I didn't turn on my camera. <laughs> I didn't want to be disrespectful uh, with, with that. But um, the thing, my husband is not here right now, but are you, I'm sure you're familiar with Edward Tufty. Mm hmm the visual display of information. We heard him speak in Los Angeles years ago and got us excited about maps and the visual display. And um, he's really inspiring. And as soon as I heard about your book, I was like, how are they doing these different displays? Um, I wonder if you have anything in there on light pollution because uh, that's, you know, I'm sure that's another idea that maybe came across, but we're working with the Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association and we're having to do these maps of the change in light pollution over you know, time, getting it from satellites and that. But we want to display it in a creative, interesting way. You know, we have colors and that. But anyway, it's just well, a wondered. I haven't seen your book yet. Well, we just so happened in our uh, previous book, Portlandness. Okay. Um, we act, act, it didn't make it in there, but we developed a, a map related to that topic oh. as the best places in the city to to actually view the night sky. Okay, yeah. Um, and yeah. it was actually a pretty interesting looking map. Um, usually have it in a different presentation of maps that didn't make the book essentially. And there's lots of those. Um, so it is something we've looked at. We didn't for all three cities, um, but we have looked at that for Portland. Okay, yeah, so so what was Portland? the name of that book? Sorry. It's called other... Portlandness, a, Portland. a, cultural, a cultural atlas. Okay. Has a have, very bright, kind of yellowy cover. Yeah, I feel like we have a copy at the store right now. I think we usually keep one in kind of our travel section. All right. 
So yeah, with that, what we tried to do with that one was create a view of the night sky from you know October or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and then indicate on a map separate to that where the best and worst places to see the stars would be. So the places with the most yeah. and the least amount of light. Yeah, it's a big job to try and <laughs> yeah. I mean, you guys put the positive spin on it. We're more looking at the negative, not negative, but the change, so that you know mm -hmm. the the legislature and county and all those people will put some rules into place but uh yeah it's really quality of life but i i just love that you're so creative with your uh, maps and that crossword puzzle was incredible <laughs> you know I, I didn't even think of it you know that's the that's why it's very um satisfying so thank you thank you do we have any other questions it looks like one of our other attendees uh, Mike? I can uh, just uh, add to um, the, my pleasure at your creativity. Uh, I was drawn to listen to um, your discussion tonight because I came across your earlier book when we were um, on excursions looking for places to maybe live in Oregon. And we spent some time in Portland at a very nice Airbnb right kind of in the middle of the Pearl District. And uh, the people who ran the place had several books out and they had one of your books, uh, one of the early books on Portland. And I just, I got so fascinated with it that I didn't see very much of Portland. It was our first trip. I just could not get past those pages were so much fun. <laughs> and it was just so, uh, such an interesting concept. Uh, it just absolutely delightful. Thank you. Very, very interesting work that you do. It's just great fun to see. Well, if you stay at one of the hotels downtown, um, you know, they they apparently have a, a book for every room. So, uh -huh. <laughs> wow, it was a very different project. Um, the three cities. I mean, Portlandness. Um, in a lot of, I mean, we live here. And it was it was a big project, but when we expanded it to three cities, we. We, we took on a lot more and, and having to find uh, themes and ideas mm -hmm. that could carry through the cities. Um, you know, we decided early on, we weren't gonna say, all right, here's Seattle, here's Portland, here's San Francisco. We wanted to look at, uh, you know, we have different themes and look at each city at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that would be mm -hmm. more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be interesting to see what you, what you think if you see the new one. Yeah. yeah. And oftentimes one, one city will dominate a topic but that's, that's okay, as long as it's relevant to all three cities. Yeah, yeah well, fascinating work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I love that crossword too, because I, uh, for about a year and a half, lived right at the junction of Maywood Park uh, mm -hmm. and Park Rose. And I did not know when I first moved there literally across the street if we walked and there was like a trail Maywood Park is its own unincorporated city within Portland and it was so weird to have this like it's very green and it's very well taken care of and then like across the street there was a shooting at the end of my street but it was just one of those things like I had lived out in the suburbs a little bit. Like I was still, you know, considered myself a Portlander, but I'd lived in Lake Oswego. And then I moved up there and one of my friends was like, do you know right across the street from you is technically its own town? And I'm like, what? Yes, yeah, so Maywood Park has a fascinating history too. Yeah. It's, the whole story is, is that the, they were building the highway through that area. And so the residents of that area saw that the development was coming through there. And they thought that if they could incorporate as an independent city, mm -hmm. that they would be able to block the highway from coming through there. Ultimately, so, they weren't able to do that, but they did get the, 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 yep. um, the grade sunk so that it's, it's much lower than the level of the rest of the neighborhood. Yeah. And so if you're driving to the airport, you'll see a sign that says, Maywood leaving Park. Portland, and then Four seconds later, you see a sign that says entering Portland and you're wondering what's going on. And that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, and they did you know, manage to make the yep. inter an Interstate 205 jog around mm -hmm. Maywood Park. It's like, why is there a weird jog in the freeway? It's because it went around the little part of the that's not Portland. Yeah, it's we, we actually wrote two pages about 
Maywood Park in Portland. Is. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> I mean, we went for walks in that area a lot because it was so much quieter. It got us off of our, so we were at Sandy in like 97, but mm -hmm. it got us away from, you know, everything. We had a little dog. We went over there all the time, but it was so funny if you like drove up I'm trying to remember, I guess it was maybe 102nd and you turned, it actually said like, this is a private, like private road. And I was like, it's a, like, they don't want you in there really. No. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting. All the street uh, signs are different place. color than the Portland yeah. street signs. Like just the little changes to let you know that you're yeah. in a different place. So funny. It, it was, it was very interesting to live in different areas of Portland and kind of like you're saying, still learn those things. I lived up there for nine years and yet I'm sure either with this book or picking up Portlandness, there's stuff where I'm like I had no idea about that because you just can't yeah it's such yeah, a I mean one thing. one of the things we couldn't do with this book although you know, I've lived in Seattle Hunter's lived in San Francisco I'm familiar with the the Bay Area quite a bit um, but we couldn't always just go on the ground to to look at something right. like you could when we were doing only portland yeah. i mean we made a number of trips to each of these cities you know always with a, a laundry list of things we needed to check out but you couldn't just go out to you know oh we want to check out this street in san francisco well that's a little bit of the trip yeah although at the same time one of the reasons for choosing these cities is because um, san francisco and seattle is because they're places that again that we 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 used to spend time in, we used to live in, that we have special connection to, and that we wanted to have to walk around as part of our jobs. So right. you know, this was, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry, I gotta go to San Francisco, you know, writing a book and we gotta go walk around for, you know, the whole week or something like that. And so, yeah. you know, you choose your research uh, locations um, intentionally, yeah. That is probably one of the best things about writing a book, either fiction or nonfiction, but especially nonfiction is when you have to go do research for your book. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, this has been absolutely delightful. I can't wait to get this up on our YouTube. Um, we have plenty of copies in the store. So if you haven't picked up a copy yet of Upper Left Cities, please drop by. If you're looking for a copy of Portlandness, obviously, if we don't have it, we will be happy to order it and we get our books really quickly. And then if you haven't been in the store recently, you'll get to see all of the black uh, plastic for our expansion, which I got to check out yesterday and is going amazingly. So um, David and Hunter, I do hope that at some point in the near future for maybe another book or just another presentation on that, you'll come and check out our store down here in Bend. We would love to have you. We would love to make that trip. Love to do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We could not be doing these things without your support of our indie bookstore and of authors like these two who bring us new and interesting things to learn about uh, the coast that maybe we thought we knew and we have no idea about really. So um, just again, thank you to everyone from us at Roundabout Books for continuing your support through these crazy times. Mm -hmm. Someday it will all make sense. I won't say we'll get back to normal because I don't know what that means. Um, but we've really appreciated everybody's support. I appreciated meeting both of you at PNBA and I'm just so excited to now share this book with more people in our area. Thank, Thank you so you. much for hosting us. Thanks for hosting yeah. us. All right, everyone have a right. great night and rest of your week. Keep reading. Good night. Good night. <laughs>